Welcome back to the AI Driven Marketer. I'm Dan Sanchez. My friends call me Danchez. And I'm still on this journey to master AI in 2024. It's the premise of this podcast currently. And I'm so excited to have Jen Furukua on the show because he's one of my favorite podcasts on this topic of AI marketing. And I came across your show just because I was, I was, uh, it was December and I was looking for paths forward to learning AI. And there was only probably like a handful, maybe like a half a dozen AI marketing podcasts, like last December, <laughs> yours was one of them. I went and subscribed to all of them, started listening to all of them. And I found that yours is one of my favorites. Cause I'm like, ah, like uh, here's somebody who's handling podcasts, like how I would handle it. Somebody that understands the strategy, but under is still playing in the weeds of the tactics and just diving into the specifics. And I was like, yes. So a lot of my episodes are like this because I just like to get down into the dirt and be like, no, but how do you do this thing? Tell me how you're using it. So I've loved your show and I can't wait to kind of like unpack your story and talk about like the premise behind your show, which is super marketers, uh, essentially using AI to become, get like a 10 X hundred X output because that's, what's becoming possible now with the tools. So welcome to the show. Dan, Dan Chess, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate it because sometimes, you know, like especially when you start a podcast, you kind of just put it out there. And uh, that's the fun part because you have the flexibility to make mistakes and, and learn. Um, but that's really why I started it too, is so that I could speak with practitioners, experts, people who are doing it so I could learn and then share. And, and um, it's kind of like a nice virtuous cycle. Same. It's like the ultimate hack to learning. I feel like yeah, totally. uh, that people don't use nearly enough because I feel like people are intimidated by podcasts. I think I've done enough that I'm just like, oh, it's really easy. How come everybody doesn't do this? But like being able to call people. I mean, I reached out to you and a few other people in the podcasting space who are doing similar podcasts. And I have you and two others to interview who are also running these same kind of podcasts and everyone's got their own unique take. Everyone's learned different things, being able to use a show to learn from people who are actually doing the work. I, I don't know how else to learn this topic because no one's right. Like there's very few books on this topic yeah, like yeah, yeah, AI yeah. or AI marketing particularly. Right. <laughs> totally. <clears throat> so uh, it's ultimate yeah. hack. I mean, I, I kind of like, I just went down this path just almost out of necessity or, or a little bit of frustration. So uh, last year I ended up selling a SaaS product. It was a quiz builder for Shopify merchants called Prehook. Basically it helps Shopify merchants ask a few questions, capture a lead, whether email or SMS, and then recommend a product. So it was a nice like micro SaaS product. And so I've been in uh, SaaS marketing since 2015. I was part of the founding team at Jungle Scout and um, basically leading the marketing team for four years there, all the way through you know $110 million fundraise from a top private equity firm. And it was, <clears throat> it was a great experience, great product, great uh, team. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I w- always wanted to do my own thing, had tried several things in the past uh, to no great avail, but now I'd had some, some ex- success leading marketing and getting a better understanding of SaaS. So I started Prehook with two of the other uh, founding members at Jungle Scout. They were both product and dev. I was doing marketing and everything customer facing. And uh, yeah, we worked really hard. It was, it was a small niche product. Uh, marketing is not necessarily so easy, especially if your price around $50 per month. So you r- yeah. really need a high volume. Uh, as opposed to, you know, a more enterprise brand, which is a slower s- right. s- sales cycle, but higher ARPU or average revenue right. per user. Um, anyway, after selling it, realized that there was AI, there was opportunity to leverage far beyond what I was doing as a bootstrap marketer. We wanted to stay bootstrapped. And so I just, I wanted to focus. Now I had the time instead of just kind of doing 10 things at once as a uh, marketer and and partnerships, affiliate, uh, support, success, all these other things, uh, I could focus solely on learning. And and so that's how I ended up really focusing on uh, how AI could be a leverage point for marketers. And so I started doing this uh, consulting with other B2B SaaS companies um, because I did have extensive experience in that. And then just sharing some of what I was learning um, on the internet (laughs) with the podcast and, and LinkedIn. And, um, and so it's just a nice way. Like I've always been a little bit more behind the scenes and not always so comfortable, like, uh, sharing things and, and like, oh, am I being self-promotional? But I think it's so important because like, that's how we connected and that's how like you just share and you learn. And, and so I'm glad that I am on this path for sure. It's funny is I don't really feel like it's the way you're doing it and the way I try to do it. Sometimes I, 
I change if I'm not careful <laughs> is it becomes, it's not self-promotional. It's like, Hey, look at this cool thing. We, I found out, or I learned you're just sharing like, Hey, I'm learning some stuff. Look at this cool thing. Look, did you know you could automate this process? I didn't. Here's what I did. You know, it's totally. just sharing what you're learning either by doing or from reading and learning from others, which I find is less selfish and is just helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And then also there is that mental shift in terms of podcasting where you don't need to be the expert. In fact, like right. you are a better interviewer or conversationalist if you are not trying to be an expert. And you can just ask questions because ultimately that's what uh, you're like uh, the representative of your audience and the people listening. So the more you can pursue that curiosity or put on your beginner's mind mindset, uh, the better a podcast it would be, in, in my opinion. I love the frame of your podcast around supermarketers because I feel like it actually does like it's, it's better than my show, which is the AI driven marketer, which isn't bad. It'll probably win the SEO game a little bit more, but yeah, <laughs> like supermarketers, I'm like, that's the outcome that I think people are looking for, looking to achieve. How, wh when did you make the the premise of your show that, and how is your focus? How, how, why have you been drawn to that in particular? Yeah. So Remember, like it was, you know, whatever, November 2022, uh, ChatGPT launched, and it, there's this euphoria and excitement. Like, oh my God, look at all these like parlor tricks, cool things that you could do. And then it maybe morphed more into like, how can you mold these prompts to be more helpful? And I was coming at, from it uh, from the perspective of a marketer and like, how can I actually use this and be more like tactical and, and um, take take use case use cases or like what I'm doing manually takes a lot of time and, and mental energy. How can I use chat GPT or other AI tools to get done what I want to get done in a far faster, more efficient way? So uh, yeah, just narrowing the focus on marketing. And even in that case, I think it's still quite broad in terms of like, are you doing it for video, email, content, social uh, design? There are so many elements of marketing. Supermarketers is quite broad still. Um, but I think that that's one thing where AI does help is it levels the playing field and it accelerates the learning process or your ability to level up so that all of a sudden, you know, I, I can do some video marketing, AI video marketing, uh, where I don't have formal training in editing or composition or lighting or anything. Um, but all of a sudden it, it, it does make it more accessible. Um, but by the same token, you know, it, it, it creates this larger mass of the mean, the average. And so, those that are a little bit better can stand out because you know we're, we're seeing this in Google's March update, for example, the March core update that ideally, or so they say, will knock out you know forty percent of spam on the internet. That's a result of this AI generated content. So um, yeah, from from the premise of how can we do more as a marketer with AI, and not only do more, but kind of like build out on your zone of genius and, and kind of like be better than just the average. Remember it's three, three years ago, I was working for a podcast agency and we were just doing some thinking about what would disrupt the agency. It was the largest B2B podcast agency and it had about a hundred clients. The next largest B2B podcast agency had maybe 44 clients. So like we were by far like double, double the next one. And our prices were increasing. We we're doing well. And they're like, what's going to disrupt us? And we were looking at different models or different agencies and up and coming. And we realized, I'm like, it's, it's not going to be another service company. It's going to be some SaaS company <laughs> that mm -hmm. puts us out of business because it used to take Sweetfish two weeks to turn around an episode. With all the editing, the video work, the blog posts, the social content, and all just all the content, it took two weeks and it had to go through a lot of hands in order to do that. Now, because of all the AI tools out there, it's three years later and I'm like, I can do everything Sweetfish did, but in like 90 minutes, just solo, yeah. which is ridiculous. It took a team of like four to five people and a producer to turn it in two weeks. What now is with one person is doable in 90 minutes. Plus, plus more with all the video like clips and all that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> I'm just I, like, I what would, the heck? It's yeah. like now possible to do superhuman or what was, was considered superhuman now. And I, I, not everybody's doing it like that. I wish more, more would. And I think as it gets easier, it'll be more and more possible. But I think that's kind of like a representation of what is happening right now is some, yeah. do you think 
all marketer, this is going to be like a thing for all marketers. Do you think people will get left like in the dust? Cause we know, uh, our, the, the guy everybody's watching in the AI space, Sam Altman has made the prediction that there's going to be a billion dollar unicorn possible with AI. Like they'll be so efficient. They'll be able to actually earn a billion in revenue, probably a SaaS individual SaaS company. Cause that's, there's multiple, like maybe $10 million apps out there that are doing that kind of money with just one person in charge that AI will make it possible to hit a billion. And, but he's also predicted like 95% of marketing tasks that are t- currently taking place will be automated in five years or something like that. So where do you think it's going to go as far as like, do you think a few select marketers will just be doing all the work and then everybody will be let go? Or do you think it'll be like more across the board? Well, <clears throat> I, I don't think people, I mean, you've, probably heard this common phrase now, it's not going to be the people that, uh, it's not going to be AI that replaces people, but there are still humans that are necessary for pulling some select dials and levers. But the the need for all these extra hands, um, and so I was just at SaaS stock the past few days, um, and AI was was a, a big part of the, of the tracks and the curriculum and what people were talking about. Um, but it's it is clear, I think, that every product is going to infuse AI in some sense, and then it's going to re- re- reduce some of this duplicacy, um, duplicative uh, headcount. And so, yeah, imagine you know, like a, an org um, would just be a few developers and uh, maybe a, a marketer, maybe an ops person, and maybe like an AI ops engineer, um, chief AI off- officer, or somebody to kind of like manipulate all of these automations. Um, but the the capacity of one person who knows how to leverage, how to build out these agents, how to train these agents and um, use the different tools is going to be enormous. I mean, a billion dollars. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's numbers far beyond my capacity to like think about it. But like what we're seeing with these solopreneurs who are doing so much by setting up these systems and automations and using AI prompts to to basically you're, you're creating these like set it and forget it systems um, where, yeah, you, you can see it's uh, it's certainly feasible. Um, and in terms of like 95% of marketers being out of work in five years. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't necessarily believe that, but I think that there's, it is moving towards that where there's going to be a lot of overlap uh, where people aren't going to be as necessary, especially once the knowledge gap decreases so that people know what tools are available, how to leverage those tools, or even just using general large language models like ChatGPT. You know, we're talking on the heels of 4.0, just releasing GPT 4.0. Um, so it's now multimodal in terms of the media that it can ingest, text, video, audio, images, uh, or text, video, audio, yeah, I- images. Um, and then, you know, so it can output all those except video at this point. Video is coming. Google just announced video. Um, we're there at their Google I.O. event. Um, and so the, the, the rapid change of development and what's possible, and, and I think people that are learning, you know, like you that are learning and sharing, um, is going to make this like all the more possible. So, um, you know, for those that might get left behind it, and I'm sure there, there will be, I've spoken to uh, many people that just don't believe that the quality or the output or uh, that they, they, do, they don't use AI and what maybe it's, due to habitual nature of like liking to do things their old way. Um, I, I think like it's going to come, you know, and, and we've seen this 20 years ago with the, the internet or 10 years ago, 15 years ago with smartphones. Um, it's just kind of like a, a force that can be stopped. Where do you think we are with the adoption curve? Oh, the, so this is, there's quantified data on this. Um, there is? Oh, dang. Where is it? <laughs> I'd love to see uh, it. So SEMrush, well, so for a content marketer, SEMrush did a study uh, released in April 2024. Um, and so they did several nice pie charts. And so maybe if you could bring it up you know, later or in your show notes. And so I think, yeah, they, they did the, the benefits of it, how they're using it, uh, and then the number of people that are not using it. And if I remember correctly, is maybe about a third of people that don't use uh, AI in their content creation. And then those that do, you know, it, it's had tremendous impact in terms of the time invested in their content, in uh, in their output, in their uh, speed to ranking content in the SERPs, in the search engine results page. 
so yeah, are, are you finding it? Yeah, I'm looking at it, but I'm not seeing like a straight up pie chart. Oh, okay. Uh, the graphic, but if I do find it afterwards, I will add that in and post, and you will be seeing that right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, nice. <laughs> if I yeah. find it, it is a it's an opt in, so you got to opt in. And for, I'll add for the more link to data. the it's a SEM Russia's blog under. Let's see, seven, is it seventy eight artificial intelligence statistics and trends for twenty twenty four? Yeah, the report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there, okay, there so is a. Uh, I'll link to it in the show notes, and I'll put that specific graph <laughs> of market share here if I can find the right one. But uh, so if it even even at one third, that's still. Gosh, where does that put in the adoption curve? That probably still puts it at like the very beginning. That that means it's crossed the chasm at one third. But I don't even know if we've gotten that far. It will cross the chasm because I just find it so useful. And so once people figure out how to just make it easy, like Loom, Loom uses AI now, or at least if you upgrade but you don't have to do anything that you weren't doing before. It just automatically writes the title and creates a summary of every video you make. Right, right. It's effortless AI. And totally. that will just be, I feel like AI will be a, there, every every software tool will get a layer of AI and some of it will be, you have to interact with it. Some will be effortless. It's just doing it based on what you're already using it, using the tool for, like Loom. It just it adds value. Or, I mean, there will be some products where you have to interact directly with AI and build out your own, AI automations and stuff. But yeah, I mean, Loom is a great example of in terms of like doing more with less. Like just a few days ago, I think that they launched an SOPs feature where basically, you know, like normally you, you might have, a, yeah, if you work that. with a VA, cool. you might be recording your screen. Here's what I do when I'm doing this and you're clicking around. Yeah. Loom actually does that. It, it would track it, it would create uh, images and SOPs with the screen share and the text. I mean, now, now that, that was actually, um, I tried something earlier with that with uh, a product called Guide, G-U-I-D-D-E. It's still a little bit clunky and a little bit, um, it took a little time. Um, but that's just, you know, th that would take so much time uh, where I wouldn't do it. But now, you know, I do it once and you get the SOPs as a result. Um, that's saving time. That's maybe, maybe that, like that's an operations person's like, it takes a lot of time for them to do that. From that, the benefit there is the the output of um, kind of shared knowledge. No longer are things siloed where there's, you know, only Danchez knows how to do this for the B2B SaaS um, podcast network, you know, or whatever it is. Like it's it's kind of like more automated and people can do this. And then imagine once you know, agents are a little more capable in what they can do. And so it all kind of compounds these step, step function yep. improvements. So it's going to move forward. It's still early. I've even, I, I do find it, it like while we say 33%, I'm just kind of like, I still, even my techie friends like are just now signing up for like chat GPT plus and they're not using it regularly. Sometimes you and I can get caught in a bubble of like a handful of people that do use it like every day, all day. Yeah. And we forget like most people aren't quite leveraging it the same way yet. <laughs> no, that, that is true. Um, and I, I've, um, Especially, I think at, at the enterprise levels, where by yeah. necessity there are more precautions in terms of oh, security or privacy. For sure, there has to be there. Um, yeah. So they're far more hesitant, um, and so it's definitely not operationalized, and, and in some ways, it's restricted. So uh, I think that's you know f f for good reason, but yeah, f at the enterprise yeah, level change. for sure, uh, far behind. What do you? When you think about AI and how it'll impact marketing, are there any ways that you kind of categorize it or think about the different parts of it at all? Have you done some thinking there? Yeah. Um, so like probably the easiest is just either content creation or summarization. Uh, yep. But I think, and and even though that's the easiest, I still think that there's a lot of value and, and uh, power to that that wasn't there before when you can just take a kernel of an idea and maybe, you know, say you're, you're putting it on LinkedIn, it, it gets some engagement, you like um, some of the feedback, that in itself can become the, uh, a, a long form blog post, can become your email yep. or email newsletter, it can become the script for your YouTube video, it can become the topic of your next yep. podcast. Um, and so I think once you, once you use that and then use it to expand and say you already have a, a library of prompts to help you repurpose from uh, one media type or platform to another. Uh, that, that's a great use case and it's a relatively low uh, barrier to entry. Um, it's really just about 
understanding what you want to do and then how you're going to structure the prompts and get the ideal output. Yeah. I almost wonder, a lot of people are coming up with content with just pure AI, but I find I'm like, I, I don't even know if anybody anytime soon will be coming up with any good content unless it's repurposing original content. That's like the only way I use AI for content is repurposing either me just like literally talking and like I'm looking for, I just got the desk, the new chat GPT desktop app. I'm so oh, excited because yeah. I can literally open up the mic now because I don't have a, I don't use an iPhone. So I haven't been able to use it that way, but now I can just like dialogue and tell, just spit thoughts into it and be like, Hey, turn that into a LinkedIn post, please. Yep. You know, it's so much smoother. So, but I feel like all content has to go through some kind of repurposing to be good. Have you seen any content where people are coming up with original content with AI? I have like a, on LinkedIn, Luke Matthews, I, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, if yeah. He, um, so he says he, he does it. Um, Matthew uh, Lakajev, um, uh, I think it's Lakajev, L-A-K-A-J-E-V, has, has done, he's got great LinkedIn content and, and he says it comes from, with help from AI. And I think what they do, what they've said that, that they do is basically just like have this repository of their previous experiences or perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. And then that just becomes part of uh, the output. And so they're kind yeah. of combining. It's still like, kind of feeding it original content though. It's still repurposing. It's just, instead of repurposing one input, it's pulling from a multitude of inputs and then creating an output. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but you know, and we were talking before, you know, like the, the value of a custom GPT. I mean, yeah, that, yeah you, you, somehow you're going to have to give it some seed Something. of an idea of, yeah. Otherwise, it's too easy to rip off, right? You got to have some kind of angle to it. Yeah. I guess the one idea I've had before that I haven't executed yet, but I, gosh, I want to so bad. I just haven't, I just haven't had the time for it is coming up with like an AI mascot. Like, or coming up with a totally fictitious character. Yeah. Like Mickey Mouse, but not Mickey Mouse. It'd be my own character. Could be ByteBot. I don't know. And you just give it a personality, a backstory, and then you just give it a profile on social and let it like, interact with people as the thing as a mascot of the company or or personality just out there you know ripping on people or giving interesting insights or just being silly out there i'm like that's that would be original content that it'd be coming up with based on how you framed it how do you put that together for marketing though i don't know yet but i'm like it would still be interesting (laughs) it'd be yeah original content i mean basically that's like the simplified version of Itana Lopez, that that pink haired Spanish AI. Oh influencer. yeah, the the fake influencer. Yeah, thing. you know her or um, character dot AI or I forget what it's called, like Cupid. Yeah, but AI. you could be able to do it for a company. Like imagine, imagine the company comes up with a fictitious villain. You know how like there's that insurance company that has chaos as a as a person oh, no, as a no, personified no. villain, right? That shows up and damages your car. I'm like, that could easily be done with AI. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I like that. And it that. would just be interesting. Like, he was showing up and just terrorizing every time. And he just showed up to a, the, as the epitome of the problem. Like an over-personified villain that your company then combats with their their sword or whatever they're selling, you know? Yeah, I <laughs> like do like be that. be interesting. You know, when uh, one of the more useless things of ChatGPT is to, like, roast you you know you could upload a, yeah, a yeah. photo and, and so i've had some fun with that i i, I do like that style of comedy too so. <laughs> but like, it, it, i need it, to find an automated you know how there's like linkedin automated linkedin ai spam you know it'd be really cool is if you bought one of those tools right now they suck i don't think they're capable of this but soon they'd probably be able to do it and you just gave it a fictitious personality and then every every time they commented it was like some kind of slam on something oh yeah from a villain's point of view but because they're a villain it's every it's all funny it's like serious but it's a villain so it's like if darth vader was showing up and sm- slamming you it'd be like yeah but it's darth vader you know yeah yeah. that'd be kind of fun i love it <laughs> ai bill burr that'll be fun for at least a year until everybody does it and then it'll be annoying yeah <laughs> exactly that's the way it goes like it's just like one step forward but that's how it is with everything so first to it is going to make a difference so you have content production as a category are there any other categories you're looking at with ai and marketing <laughs> Yeah, data analysis. So that's with yep. uh, advanced data analysis. Um, and you know, I, I used to be using it a lot, um, not as much anymore. But 
you know, for example, you can just draw correlations. You can like, so for example, if you're uh, exporting your search console data and you're looking at uh, your blog post titles and click through rate and, and impressions. And so you can identify um, what's working, what topics are good, uh, just based on um, looking at the click through rate or the position uh, and then expand on that more. So that becomes like the core content cluster. Uh, and then you're expanding on that. Uh, or, yep. you know, you could do the same with um, you, YouTube data, you know, in terms of like uh, analytics there. Also, interestingly, you can uh, use the, the visual element of it where you take a screenshot of, like, let's say, for example, you go to a like Mr. Beast um, videos and you sort by most popular, you can take a screenshot of that. And then you can say, all right, what would be this Tell me the trends of, of why thumbnails. they're popular. Yeah. yeah. Or what, what's what a common, common reoccurring best. thing that's across this popular videos. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Or maybe if it's, you know, in, in your case, um, you know, like Matt Wolf is a, a big AI YouTuber, yep. like yep, what yep. type of content does best for him. Um, and so you can look at that, or you can even look at like uh, VidIQ or TubeBuddy um, for that. So uh, yeah, the, the data analysis and incorporating visuals um, could be interesting to identify patterns that are harder to find uh, if you're just looking at it. Any, so we have content production, data analysis. Do you have any other buckets? Buckets? Um, one, uh, I mean, I don't know if you consider this like content production, but like programmatic SEO, um, that I think is, you know, hit or miss. Like I, I think some of these sites um, might've been impacted in the March core update, but if you can incorporate some proprietary data or something that's more unique, and so programmatic SEO is basically creating content at scale around certain themes or um, following certain templates, uh, like you know, yeah. Yelp, like for example. Is pretty good at it. Yeah, Zapier does it with their integrations. Yelp does it with their you know best blank in blank, like best yeah, coffee shops in Austin. Content. Um, yeah, yep. <clears throat> and so creating that at scale, done that a uh, couple times and um, has been has been good uh, in terms of the content output uh, and the results. Um, so the, the tools there are basically using Google Sheets and then GPT for Sheets. So GPT for Sheets is just a, a Chrome extension or, or an add-on in Google Sheets that allows you to make um, a, open AI calls or just to create prompts in Google Sheets. And what's nice is you can like create very detailed prompts and then you're creating the output, but it's a very, very narrow section of the page. Like it would be, yeah. you know, so we're doing a, a one glossary, um, you know, a definition of the term, then you're doing the use case, then you're doing the pros and cons, and you're doing, um, you know, the history of it. Uh, yeah. And so each one you'd create you a prompt for, <clears throat> and then, for sheets. yeah, you can I wonder, do, has Google like pushed their AI into the Google Sheets yet? Like they just made a bunch of announcements. That's not one that I heard though. Well, I mean, with with um, Gemini, you can access data from anything in your Google suite. So yeah. you, you could, in theory, pull data from a sheet. I know with Microsoft Copilot, you can do it with Excel now. But I like the use case I saw for it is like, what formula would I need to do this and this with these two cells, you know? And it'll oh, be like, oh, oh yeah. well, you want this formula. Here's what the data would look like. Is that about right? You're like, Yes, execute that across the whole freaking column, oh, which yeah, is yeah. really cool. <laughs> but part of me is like, yeah, but can you ask it questions and be like, hey, based on this data, like what trends do you see? You yeah. know, that's that's a whole nother level that I haven't seen a lot of people doing yet. But I'm excited for it. Like, mm -hmm. man, it's getting it's close. Do you use what do you do you use Microsoft Copilot at all? Or Gemini? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah. You know, I I, I pay for Gemini. Uh, I, I used to use it, but now I just kind of use uh, ChatGPT and Claude. Yeah, yeah. I'm just all in on ChatGPT right now because I haven't seen anything useful. I'm I'm really close to my ex getting Microsoft Copilot just because one, I actually really love, even though most people in SaaS hate Microsoft, I'm like, 365 is really good. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I love okay. 365, even though for some reason, people, I, I don't know what, it, I think that past Apple campaigns, like, put their brand equity down in Silicon Valley's eyes so low <laughs> from, from long ago that people, that they're still recovering from that. Yeah, but yeah, I find 365 to be pretty good. 
but I can't wait to like see how Copilot can work with all that stuff. I think it's still early days and it's still hard to integrate these things. But yeah. I just found out you can build custom GPTs in Copilot. Like they have a feature like that. Oh, okay. Now the one thing that I'm like, yeah, but is it going to have that voice feature that G- Chat GPT just launched or is rolling out right now? Yeah. Um, because well, that's, I, yeah, I don't that's have access level too. That's going to keep me on Chat GPT now instead of moving over to Copilot. <laughs> Yeah, I was using voice on desktop. It's uh, a Chrome extension called Mia, M-I-A. So I don't have access to the desktop app yet. I tried yesterday. I think they just let it go today. I just downloaded oh, they, okay. it, but it didn't have the new. I So I, ha- I just got the desktop app today, but it, they, hadn't, they haven't released the updated voice feature. It has the old voice feature that, that people had access to on phones. Oh, okay. So it's getting close. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week it'll be out. Nice. Um, there's a few other areas that I've been thinking about for marketing uh, as far as functions go. I, I actually sat down and probably spent two hours just thinking about like, where does AI fit in marketing? And I put together five, five different functions. You named like two of them. The other ones I have, and I want to see if you agree with them. If, if These are like major categories to put them in. What I have at the center is like an internal co-pilot, like every team across the org, but including marketing will have like co-pilot systems like a shared GPTs and some like mm-hmm. Microsoft Copilot or something as an internal AI resource. I feel like that'll just be cross departmental, maybe organization wide, but at least within your department, you'll have something like that. Yeah. But from there, two other categories I have are like conversational AI, essentially chatbots. I think it's going to add more and more value and will have to be engineered to, I think can go cross from site chat to, uh, social media to text messaging, like handling conversations with people and DM prospects, uh, not in a spammy way, but like in a inbound way that helps people answer questions, serve them with best resources, you know, and it's just doing what a, like an entry level employee would be doing essentially. Mm-hmm. And then the last one I have is hyper personalization where it's like taking things and actually like, I imagine that's where a lot of owned media is going. Your email marketing, your text message marketing, your owned websites, like they're going to be personalized by AI eventually in real time. But for now, like email newsletters will be like, like in uh, the hustle, you can kind of pick like, Oh, I want these things in my newsletter and these things not in my newsletter. So it kind of customizes it again, but pretty soon AI will be able to like really personalize it to where people are getting different kinds of content based on, what it knows about you or what you've engaged with before. So those are the kind of five categories, analysis, content production, conversational AI, hyper-personalization, and then uh, internal co-pilots. Those are kind of like the five areas that I'm thinking. And I'm like, are there more? Are those, do those overlap too much? Uh, (laughs) It's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah. I mean, one would be like somehow video. I don't know if video is part of, the, the content creation or personalization, but um, I think AI videos is obviously going to be uh, only getting more uh, uh, traction and, and um, improvement. Maybe another might be um, like IRL, you know, like real world. And that was kind of like the premise of that 4.0 demo is when you, your phone becomes, you know, you can take images of your phone. It can c- capture the context of, what you are, it can catch or, capture the nuance of a conversation or the different voices in a conversation or real time translation. Um, what is IRL? I'm like I, Googling. In real life. In real life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. What <laughs> yeah. term is that? I'm like, is that a TikTok term or yeah, I don't a, know. I, a marketing yeah. term? <laughs> Probably a, a Gen Z term I'm trying to adopt. <laughs> yeah. So in real life, like real time customization or yeah yeah like you know maybe this is where the apple vision pro fits in in some ways too where uh there's you know you're you're using it and you you have like a heads-up display or something and and um it's kind of becomes this overlay of of the real life and i actually don't even think it's that far away as crazy as crazy as it might sound yeah um but yeah that that was a few few months ago, the rabbit was like getting all this hype. Turns out to be it was just hype and and not a lot of substance there. Uh, but yeah, combining like the the visual, the audio, and and uh, text. Yeah, I could see it being real time, just around the corner. I mean, I don't think any of us were 
even prepared for where Sora was going to be just in February. We're like, oh, I thought that was like a year away. Mm -hmm. And then bam, it hits. You're like, oh, well. And then uh, Meta's AI tool can do image generation in real time. Like as you're typing, it's changing the image, which if you haven't tried that is just mind blowing how fast it's loading Dolly level images as you're typing it. So you're like a girl and then it has a girl sitting at the corner and it's got him around the street of a diner uh, and then it's changing the diner. It's like morphing as you're typing it and it has the girl and it's just changing it as you go. You're like, what the frick? How fast? It's yeah. so fast. Yeah. It's in and real time. How do you access it? And I'm like, it's yeah, it's free. Try it. Try it. It's the image creation on it is just so freaking fast that you can even make little GIF videos of the transformation. Some part of me is I'm like, how do I turn that into content? Because that's kind of cool to watch it transform but I haven't thought of a good marketing application of that little clip yet. Mm. Well, I mean, that that's combining personalization with you know, ads. So uh, ads might be uh, content creation, um, but when you're able to create a, a uh, an advertisement that hooks you based on your particular problem um, and speaks to you contextually, you know, Dan in Nashville again in Austin, uh, yeah, that, that resonates far more. Yeah, there's... Yeah, it ends up falling somewhere between like content production and personalization where you're like creating content, personalized content at scale through ads or mm-hmm. or owned media or whatever. I don't know. It's going to be an interesting world. What are you finding is the, like, the most helpful AI processes you're using on a regular basis? Like what are you coming back to over and over again? It's just so helpful. <clears throat> Probably, well content generation and repurposing um those two just because i like i'm doing that a lot for uh for clients um then also the like the transcription so uh using video and using that as a basis for um creating like other assets mainly uh blog posts email and social i mean again that's repurposing but um it is like one of the go-to's um but yeah for anybody listening like one helpful thing is if, say, for example, you watch a YouTube video that you like, you can get the YouTube transcript, uh, but a nice extension is GLASP, G-L-A-S-P dot co. And so that pulls in the transcript in, in a nice way that um, you know, can be the basis for you to uh, replicate, repurpose, use it as an inspiration for your own post where you can just copy the transcript or you can go directly into ChatGPT. Um, and then GLASP has its own repository of sorts of like the best or, or most uh, saved content online from, you know, class users. Yep. What other than jet chat GPT and Claude, like what are your favorite AI tools right now? <clears throat> you know, w- one that I use a, a lot is Descript and I, it's, you know, not like an AI tool per se, but it is because the transcription is really good. Uh, and then it just makes it very easy to do, um, to again, to multi-purpose things. Um, I'm starting to shift from Zapier to Make. And, mm. you know, that's one of the things I'm working on for myself is just to be more efficient operationally and um, to, to make things automated uh, and to kind of like force that part of my time and my brain to put things down and, and create systems around it as opposed to doing it again and again and again. Um, so yeah, yeah you, it, YouTube's been following me around with like how to automate things with make. And I've like watched one or two, but now it's starting to show me more. And I'm like, Oh yeah. What, like, what are you working on making in make? Uh, so a repurposing, um, repurposing tool. So, you know, taking that one piece, that one blog post and going to LinkedIn, um, yep. the carousel, uh, text, social email, um, so you can do that. All you do is you're you're basically you have one node, and then you're uh, creating branches from it, <clears throat> and each has its own specific prompt. And you can change the prompt all the time, so you you can continue to improve and iterate on it. Um, so that's one. Um, and then working with like the team, uh, in particular, like editors, or copy editors, uh, designers to um, to improve like the flow of, of how work goes from like me creating it to uh getting like reviews or help or or, uh, making sure all assets are done in that um so that kind of like reviews uh uses make and frame.io 
Interesting. So you're just using it to fill in the processes a little bit. Yeah. More. Yeah. Because chat GPT is good for creating those things, but it, it's still kind of a manual process. You got to prompt to move it along, even if it's multi-step and you have to like, you can't automatically send it somewhere. You have to, everything you do from there has to be copy and pasted out. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So man, I'm still make, make is okay. I think I mentioned on your show that Cassidy is the one I'm kind of playing with. Sure. Yeah. Still kind of like, mm, so, so with, all of them. I'm still, I think everybody's trying to learn right now of how to bridge the gap between automation and AI right now. Right? Yeah. Like how do I put the input and in automatically do some AI stuff and then output it? That's the trick. I feel yeah. like a lot of us are pushing on the edge of trying to make AI a, a fast task into a, just an automated task. Cause you want the same thing every time totally. with the same prompt. Yeah. Make has a little bit more of a learning curve, but it's significantly cheaper than Zapier. Uh, and going to be for, more flexible, so something you can grow into. Uh, I but find yeah, Zapier that, to be really confusing. As well, much as they're going <laughs> to this area with this canvas and stuff, I got in there and I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> tried, yeah, did you I, try the AI builder? To learn, I can't. Yeah, the AI builder can like help at least like set up the framework of like how you're doing things. Uh, but yeah, it, it can be a little confusing for sure. And what are you looking forward to do doing? Like, what do you see like within the next six months being something that even is something you've done and are like even reselling as a service since it's something you're doing with clients now that's maybe not possible yet, but is just like on the horizon. What do you think? Where do you think it's going over the next six months? <clears throat> yeah, I think like outbound is something that I've, I'm not using now, but I think has a lot of potential and I'm like, I should be, but, um, uh, Maybe I'm just not there yet, like for, for my own self or even like having a, an offer nailed down. But uh, by outbound, I basically mean like you just have your your conception of like, here's my ideal customer persona. Here's uh, their position, their their uh, type of company. Like, let's say, for example, it's B2B SaaS companies of um, in doing one to 10 million in the US and focus specifically in like e-commerce and AI. Uh, so you can use different tools to find that whole entire universe of those people. Even it, it could even just be sales navigator. Uh, and then you're basically creating outreach campaigns. So it might be with a tool like instantly or Lemlist, um, where, where you're like actually c contacting them. Maybe it's using clay to enrich the data and, yeah. um, personalize more at scale. Um, uh, but I think like that type of, um, campaign and, uh, output is has high value and i think now is a good time because there's arbitrage but again like as more people learn that we're just all going to be inundated with a, a lot more inbound junk or, or inbound stuff uh, unless your your promise of personalization is true and and you know those that really master it can stand out from the crowd yeah i still feel like it's still going to be like the more personalized and more targeted you can be, the the better it's going to perform, yeah. whether it's yeah. automated or not. So, but right now, like the amount of time it takes to make it that personalized still takes more time than making it less personalized. Yeah. So it just depends on what you want to do. I almost wonder really, it's like you wonder like, where's the breakdown? Like, is it worth me putting into that much more effort as far as the conversion rate goes? Maybe, maybe not. I'm sure the, 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 the higher up you're targeting, and the bigger the companies you're targeting probably changes that dramatically. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, you, you want a referral ideally. You want CMOs of fortune 100. Well, that <laughs> probably shouldn't be automated at all. <laughs> yeah. You probably should do a custom outreach thing and it's all hand done, but the farther down you go and the less expensive it is, then it makes sense. Totally. Cool. And are there any last tips you'd love to give to the audience as far as things you've learned that you wish you would have known like six months ago? Uh, six months ago. Yeah, I think, I think it, it would be, I mean, I was playing around and I think like that might be a necessary part of the learning curve is like getting your hands dirty and, and uh, learning. I would want to go, if I could rewind time, like start earlier with like, playing around with make or Zapier and like, how can you use these open AI, um, API calls or how can you use actions or how can you like kind of get the, the foundations of these agents, um, to do more, uh, once a process is more, uh, more defined in your own mind. So you've done it like three, five times, you know, you're going to continue doing it. 
at that point, invest a little bit of time up front to work on the automation part. I think like if I had focused on that more, I would have been kind of like in this hamster wheel of sorts of like doing things that I'm doing repetitively, um, even though I think it's important. And ultimately, I think anything that requires uh, or that, that passed off to a client requires human intervention. I think that there's a lot more that can be done with automation and good prompts uh, rather than manually going through and doing it. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the show. If you're listening to this, go and listen to Supermarketers. It is a fantastic show. I'm listening to it. I highly recommend if you want to get more out of AI in marketing, this is a show you have to go listen to. So again, thanks for joining me today. Dan Chis, thanks so much. 